Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Hawaiian Affairs um, Committee hearing. Um, just want to explain how things are going to go today, um, at least the intention of the chair. So, I um, mean, welcome. We have, uh, looks like we have all committee members here. Vice Chair Jarrett Keohokalole, um, Senator Laura Casio, Senator Les Ihara Jr., and Senator um, Kurt Favela. Mahalo. Um, and so, you know, we have received an, um, a lot of testimony. Um, I can give you the numbers on the casino bill. There are, we have a petition of 15,600 people submitted by Senator Favela against um, SB 1321. Plus we have 209 that submitted regular testimony against the casino bill, 32 in support and six with comments. Um, given the response we've received, um, we're very grateful that our Ways and Means Chair, Senator Donovan De La Cruz has proposed what we think is a very, is a good compromise and a good um, way to amend this measure. Um, and so I wanna briefly go over um, the proposed SD1 that we'd like all of you that are listening to consider. Um, the bullet points briefly are, the bill acknowledges and reaffirms the self-determination nature of the Hawaiian Homes Commission and empowers them to decide what is best use of their land. Number two, the bill does not green light a gaming facility. Only the commission can do that, which they haven't yet. This bill simply gives the commission the power and authority to make that decision. Number three, the commission may approve a gaming facility by issuing a general lease or entering into a development agreement with an entity who is prepared to plan, design, construct, operate, and manage it. This bill reflects legislature's belief that it should be up to the commission to decide if they should do so. Number four, this bill does not legalize gaming across the board. It gives a limited exception to the commission as they exercise autonomy in the use of their lands. Number five, this bill establishes a commission to regulate gaming if the commission so chooses to implement it, and a taxation mechanism designed to provide 80% of the tax revenue to the commission and Native Hawaiians to reaffirm the legislature's commitment to prioritizing Native Hawaiians. Number six, this bill does not allow Indian tribes to freely game in Hawaii. That would require historical tie to the land and approval from our governor. Number seven, this bill establishes a sunshine, uh, sunset deadline of December 31, 2026 for the commission to conduct beneficiary consultation, exercise due diligence, and enter into development agreement or issue a general lease. If the commission decides, declines to do so, revisions of the bill and limit exceptions to the state's prohibition on gaming expire. And the bill is Chair? also gonna require a super majority. Yes. I'm yes, sorry, it might be me on my, it, I'm sorry, it might be me on my end, but could you read the last two points, please? I, I missed them. Okay. Number six, the bill does not allow Indian tribes freely to game in Hawaii. That require historical tie to the land and approval from our governor. Um, number seven, the bill establishes a sunset deadline of December 31, 2026, for the commission to conduct beneficiary consultation, exercise due diligence, enter into a development agreement or issue a general lease. If the commission declines to do so, the provisions of this bill and the limited exception to the state's prohibition on gaming expire. And then the bill also, um, another thing we, that um, Representative Senator Dela Cruz recommended is to um, make, require a supermajority of the commission to approve any gaming facility. And so the plan is that we are going to um, defer decision making on, after, after conducting the hearing today, we're gonna defer decision making to next week, Tuesday, one o'clock. And on our agenda for the hearing for next week, Tuesday, we will post the proposed Senate draft for the public and everyone else to review. Um, so, and, and open for the discussion. And in addition to that, we have a 101 agenda that some of you may have seen that has two short form bills on it. And these provide some additional alternatives for DHHL um, to raise funds. And this came through discussion with Senator Favela who suggested the first um, bill and then also just some other suggestions that came and so um, we're gonna decision, just do decision-making and we're gonna insert contents for these um, provisions into these short form bills and then we'll schedule the hearings at a later date. So SB 85 is gonna be um, authorizes DHHL to engage in lottery and bingo enterprises pursuant to state law. And then SB 86 authorizes DHHL to engage in the operation of medical cannabis dispensaries. Um, okay, so what I'd like to do 
committee is take a vote on these two short form bills now so we can get the content inserted and then later we'll schedule a public hearing for testimony. Um, and so, I don't know. So is there any discussion on those two short form bills, SB 85, SB 86 members? Okay, so seeing none, um, Vice Chair Keoko, can you can take the vote on the two short form bills, please. Passing with amendments vote. Okay, uh, members voting on SB 85, the chair's recommendation is to pass with amendments. Chair Shima Bukuro. Aye. Vice Chair goes aye, Senator Ocasio. Ole. Senator Ihara. Aye on this procedural vote. Senator Favela. No. Uh, recommendation adopted. Uh, on you. SB 86, the chair's recommendation is to pass with amendments. Uh, chair Shimon Bukoro. Aye. Vice Chair goes aye, Senator Ocasio. Aole. Senator Ihara. Aye. Senator Favela. No. Chair recommendation adopted. Thank you very much. So now we'll go into our 1 p.m. regular agenda on, um, yeah, on SB 1321. And first up, we'll call DHHL. On behalf of Chairman William Isla, based on the amendments that have been proposed by Senator Dela Cruz, the department still stands in full support of the bill as amended uh, for several reasons. We appreciate the reaffirmation of self-determination and autonomy within the Hawaiian Homes Commission. I think with 100 years behind us, the nine commissioners who choose to do this job every day have the, the wealth of knowledge, the expertise, and the background to understand the gravity of this decision. And I think that the Senate deciding to empower them to make that decision for themselves is monumental in this sort of 100 year history. Um, the department is not opposed to the five year sunset deadline because I think it addresses a lot of our beneficiaries concerns. It gives five years for the department to do due diligence, extensive beneficiary consultation, get actual projections and get pro forma from anyone who's interested to help the commission make a more informed decision. Uh, really, there's, there's nothing more important I think than the Senate choosing to entrust the commission to make the best decision for its beneficiaries. And these amendments reflect that. The other comment that we would add is that this bill was never intended to automatically greenlight a casino. It was meant simply to give the, the uh, commission the authority to do so. I think these amendments more accurately reflect that and recommit the Senate towards um, you know, empowering Native Hawaiian management and Native Hawaiian decision-making for Native Hawaiians. Uh, in that regard, uh, we send a strong support. We're happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Deputy Director. Um, next, we have HPD in opposition. Hey, good afternoon. I'm uh, Captain Kyle Numasaki with HPD. Uh, we stand by um, our written testimony in opposition of the bill. Okay. Thank you very much. Next up, um, prosecuting attorney on um, opposition. Thank you, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee, Deputy Prosecutor Trisha Nakamons on behalf of the Honolulu Prosecuting Attorney. We are strongly opposed to the bill and you have our written testimony, so I'll just be brief. Uh, with the, the department has the greatest respect for the Hawaiian community's uh, right and um, to, uh, to affirm their own self-determination and ability to the desire and need to raise funds to ensure that they're able to meet their goals and mission. However, this is one idea that is gonna have far reaching impacts, not just on the Hawaiian community, not just on the immediate community surrounding the proposed casino, but on the entire island. And that is of grave concern to the department. Uh, as the studies indicated that we referenced in our report, even just the opening of a single casino can have serious ramifications for increase in crime, of course, for other social ills, um, divorce, bankruptcy, things of that nature. Uh, it is widely studied that especially problem gambling can um, affect the families, domestic violence. Um, there is reports, of course, uh, even locally from the Hawaii Status uh, Commission on the Status of Women regarding 
potential ramifications for sex trafficking as well. We're available for questions and thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you very much, Trisha. Um, next, Tax Foundation of Hawaii with comments. Hi, Senator, they're not present. Okay. Next, um, Hawaii Ironworkers Stabilization Fund, Makana Paris and support. Aloha Chair Shimo Bukuro, Vice Chair Koko Holole and members of the committee. My name is Makana Paris on behalf of T. George Paris, our Managing Director of the Hawaii Iron Workers Stabilization Fund. We stand in strong support of SB 1321. This bill is fundamentally about housing Native Hawaiians families. The state faces a financial crisis like never before in our history and our Native Hawaiian neighbors are already disproportionately represented in the houseless count across the islands. Over half a million Hawaii citizens have filed UI claims last year alone. Families are out of work. Families are back on their rent. Families are facing foreclosures. Families are choosing between groceries, medication, and other necessities. A looming tsunami is on the horizon and our Native Hawaiian neighbors and their families will again be disproportionately affected. What can, in the short term, we can provide much needed worker relief while balancing the state budget. In the medium term, we can fund the only department as a constitutional mandate to provide housing to Native Hawaiians and their local families. Let's allow the Hawaiian Homes Commission and their beneficiaries the ability and the authority to fully explore limited gaming and an integrated resort. An integrated resort would provide hundreds of construction jobs thousands of hospitality jobs, and a much needed revenue boost to both the department and the state. So let's get our people to work. Let's support our local business and economy to house our native Hawaiian neighbors and their local families. Mahalo for this bold consideration. Okay. Okay, hold on, hold on. Procedural. Commit to the Hawaiian. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, I just got a note from the clerk's office. We just we made a procedural error with the two short form bills. So I'm sorry, members. This, we need to go back real quickly to SB 85 and 86. Um, okay. So we need to reconsider our previous action, right? And we need to amend the bills and also recommit them to Hawaiian Affairs. Is that correct, Keahi? Yeah. Yes. So, okay. So I'm so sorry. So Vice Chair, if we can make that motion. So we're gonna reconsider previous action. Um, we're gonna amend the bills and then recommit them to Hawaiian. So if we can start with SB 85. Okay, members, uh, noting all members present. Uh, uh, are there any members yeah, in yes. opposition? Oh, I'm sorry, Senator Dehar, did you have a question? Yeah, I'm looking at the um, legislative manual and it says that in a short form bill, the revised bill is then uh, amended in committee to an SD1 mm -hmm. and then the re I'm quoting, the, re the revised bill is then sent to the floor where the committee report will be adopted and the amended bill rec recommitted to the, regional, to the original committee. A normal public hearing on the bill can then be scheduled to receive testimony. So based on our staff procedures, I'm not sure what which one the clerk is looking at. This uh, is the clerk telling us to do this, right? She's saying it's that we have to vote to reconsider, we have to amend it and recommit to Hawaiian, so. Yeah, but it goes to yeah. the floor, doesn't it? Yeah, I'm not sure what, yeah, that's yeah. what we got the call from the clerk's office, so. And well, uh, SMA, so, yeah. Right. So I, I would, uh, support the procedure that's in the manual, which is to recommit and and uh, uh, submit it to the floor, and then it comes back. Then then the floor accepts the committee report. Okay. And 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 then once they accept the committee report, the committee report recommends recommittal 
to the committee. And then once the floor accepts the committee report, then that action, it effectuates an action to go back to the committee. Okay, so, so you're saying that we, the, the vote we took was already proper? Well, I'm not sure what, what, was the, what was the vote prior. We just, we did a vote to amend both bills. Right, but it did not have the recommittal. No. She said you want to recommend, but it, but then okay, the. But let's, okay, let's, let's take a, we got to take a recess, recess. We thought that Okay, we're back, calling back to order the Hawaiian Affairs hearing. So we're gonna go back to reconsider our vote on SB 85 and SB 86, the two short form bills. So we're gonna reconsider our previous action and we're gonna um, vote, I'm recommending we amend both bills and recommit both bills to the Hawaiian Affairs Committee. So vice chair, if you could please take the vote. Uh, members, you've heard the bills and the recommendations. Uh, so I will just proceed with the vote. Chair Shima Bukoro. Aye. Vice Chair goes aye, Senator Ocasio. Reservations. Senator Ihara. Aye. Senator Favela. No. Chair recommendation adopted. Thank you so much. Okay, and I apologize to the others. We're gonna return back then to SB 1321. Next up, we have the Sovereign Council of Hawaiian Homelands Assembly, um, Robin Punani Danner in opposition. Hello, Robin. Hi, Senator, can you hear me okay? Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for having this hearing. Uh, the Shaw is a 34-year-old uh, wholly dedicated Hawaiian Homes Commission Act beneficiary organization. Um, we have a policy council that has worked um, on this issue, and we have provided your committee with a very thorough analysis uh, of the notion of gaming on our trust lands, which is different from the larger discussion around state government wanting to have gaming in the state. Uh, we speak in absolute opposition to a bill that would authorize a state government to take uh, our land and to open and operate uh, a casino. I was asked earlier today uh, how all of these legislative initiatives by DHHL to do gaming and lotteries and whatnot, how it made me feel. Didn't expect that question. And as a lifelong Hawaiian Homes Commission Act beneficiary, still on the wait list, along with uh, many of our Shaw leaders, um, and where this is my sixth governor, uh, many of our leaders, it's their 10th or 11th uh, directors. And while uh, Bill Isla and Tyler Gomes, really well-meaning people, uh, are uh, the eighth or 10th set of DHHL directors. Uh, and we will welcome a new set in just 18 months. Uh, how it made me feel, if in all honesty, was tired. Uh, frankly, Senator, um, it was like watching really a rerun of a movie that doesn't end well. And so uh, what we'd like to say is that we want DHHL to focus on its mission, not expand its mission. This is not in its kuleana. Uh, and we would like the legislature to oversee that and to direct DHHL to take the steps it has right now to spend the well over uh, $200 million that's in its possession to start building out lots and let's start issuing a uh, wait list uh, people uh, their homestead lots. So mahalo nui Senator uh, Shimon Bukuro. Thank you so much, Ms. Danner. Um, next, Catherine McKenzie in opposition. Is she on the line? Hi, Senator, they're not present. Okay, we can come back to her if she gets um, on. Oriana Leao um, in support. Aloha, can you hear me clearly? Yes, thanks for your patience, yes. Aloha Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee, Aloha Mai Kako. My name is Oriana and I stand on my written testimony in support. At the end of the day and at the beginning of this new va or era, this is about self-sufficiency and the urgency for something new and better. 
Where are our spaces as Native people? And how do we truly envision our economic future? And like Kumu Lili Kala inquired, Pehelai Ponoai, how shall we live in harmony? You see, land in Hawaii is finite, and the Hawaii state economy may be diminishing and seeking recovery, but mana is infinite. It's no secret that the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act was founded by Prince Kuhio. The prefix of his name, Ku, means to stand tall, erect. He is the god of war, the god of politics and masculinity. It is also the name of a season that we are about to enter into. The suffix of his name, Hio, means to fall sideways, lean, slant, diagonal. Will we choose one or the other? Or will we be like Prince Kuhio, the chief who leaned forward as he stood? I don't know how many sacrifices our ancestors have had to make to get us to this point, but today I speak in support for what is necessary to take us to the next point. Ahuiho and mahalo for the opportunity to provide testimony. Thank you so much, Ms. Liao. Next, Godfrey Akaka in opposition. Hi, Senator, they're not present. Okay, next, Patty Kahanamoku Teruya in opposition. Oh yeah, un unmute, uh, okay. unmute, Patty. Okay, um, now. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Hi, I'm Patty Kahanamoku Teruya, a resident of Nanakuli Ahupu Aha Beneficiary Hawaiian Homestead. I serve as one of the Oahu DHHL commissioners and as a chair of the Nanakuli Maili Neighborhood Board. I had the privilege of serving on the neighborhood board since 1994. Today, I do not speak as a DHHL commissioner or chair of our neighborhood board, but as an individual citizen and a homestead beneficiary. I stand in opposition to Senate bill for the many reasons that will not benefit our native Hawaiian beneficiaries or waitlists. Since statehood 1959, our state of Hawaii has not supported legalizing gambling. Further, many people in Hawaii oppose gambling because it will take away your ohana family atmosphere for the same reasons, create more problems and chaos. People gamble for many different reasons. Gambling is not a problem until it becomes an addiction and that can be more harmful on our mental health. Gambling in Hawaii is legal, but access through technology and inexpensive trips to Vegas, there are residents in Hawaii who do experience problems with gambling. The past officials who served before you fought so hard to keep gambling out of Hawaii. We have heard from many attorney general prosecutor's office, our Hawaii Finance Police Department, that they echo the same sentiments. The AG's office has stated many concerns. I have known that the Department of Hawaiian Homelands for years has allowed general leases or prime trust commercial lands to foreigners, shopping centers, and not collect market value rent. Further during this process, we have had the lack of proper beneficiary consultation. They have overlooked beneficiaries in so many areas in order to push this proposal through this legislation of 2021. As a homestead beneficiary, this legislation proposal to authorize gambling on Hawaiian homes is during the toughest time in our state through the COVID pandemic. Both bills are designed to support the state of Hawaii's deficit during the toughest time to brought up to the COVID-19. May I also add in our homestead departments, right now, our community, can I finish? I'm almost done. Yes, the sure. numerous abandoned yes, homes that have been sitting for over 15 years, the uncontrollable illegal gambling, the drug distribution, the zoning laws that are broken. There are so many, so many flaws that this department must fix to recognize and due to the continued lack of enforcement, DHHL staff has been keeping homesteads in oppression and depression. Senator Shimabukuro, this is your district and I'm mentioning it to you. One of the largest Hawaiian homestead homesteaders that reside in your district. Why would you serve something, another method to dis in destruction in your own community? I urge all senators to be, and not to be a rubber stamper by supporting to move this forward but to make sure that this beautiful state of Hawaii remains in the island of Ohana, values in a place for your children and mine. Mahalo for this opportunity. I also wanted to add, Senator, during this amendment that you propose and the deadline for Tuesday, it doesn't give the commissioners or beneficiaries the opportunity to vent on your amendment that you propose on the floor today. That is very important that we have time to look at these amendments. Further, the commission should be able to express that 
and be able to look at the amendments. The next meeting is Tuesday on the 16th. It doesn't give us enough time to vet that amendments that you propose. So please consider that very openly. We meet Tuesday the 16th. Your deadline, I, I, I heard that was Tuesday the 16th. It doesn't give the commission enough time to evaluate that amendment that you're proposed and you voted on. Thank you very much, Senators. Aloha. Thank you so much, Ms. Teruya. Um, Ellen Cardenas Jr. in opposition. Hey, Senator, they're not in the room. Okay. Malia Otto in opposition. I'm outside here um, with everybody. Uh, definite opposition for me. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. This is Hawaii. I disagree with, um, can you guys hear me okay? Yes, yes. Thank you so much for letting me testify. Um, I disagree because, uh, and it doesn't even matter what I say as much as what the experts have said. This is not just an industry on its own. It's an industry that can, could only bring with it degeneracy. You heard HPD just said, I mean, what more can we <laughs> go by? They know. So as much as it promises to uplift the community, I don't see that the things that it takes away from the community and the increases on the plethora of ills, which everyone has already said, is worth it. And some of these ills, yes, it can bring in money. Yes, we need money. But some of the things that it causes cannot be cured by money. And, and a vote of I in this is just a vote choosing to overlook our most vulnerable people who would be affected by this. It's unconscionable as a society that we can say I to something that would disproportionately affect those that are very vulnerable. I'm in, emphatically in opposition of this. Um, it's not the time and this is not the place. This is not the way. So um, I'm, a, I'm a concerned mother. Um, the experts have said that this will increase child trafficking. That means more than one the studies show a lot more than one would happen were this to be brought here. And that's blood we don't want on our hands. It's, we don't want that for the society here. There's a person who's able to make a decision of I or Aole, it must be Aole for the benefit of them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Otto. Um, Homolani Shadel in support. Mahalo. Thank you. Hello, Ms. Shadell. <clears throat> Aloha Chair Shimabukuro, Vice Chair Kyoho Kololi, and members of the committee. Um, I am Homilani Shadell, uh, testifying in my ind uh, individual capacity. You do have my written testimony, and I just wanted to make a, a few comments. Um, when DHHL took a bold step and announced their proposal for this gaming bill, my heart sank. My first thought was that we are desperate and they are taking desperate measures. How do we get so low on the list when we should be first? There were four other bills that followed introducing some form of gambling. The concerns of addiction and social ills a casino will bring is not lost on me. Some form of organized gambling takes place every day across our islands and will continue whether or not this bill is passed. Just this past Sunday, hundreds of thousands of dollars passed through hands, betting on the Super Bowl and at chicken fights. The act of gambling is a personal choice. I am a gambler. Each time I place a wager or play a machine in Vegas, it is my personal choice and my kuleana to manage. The definition of gamble is to take risky action in the hope of a desired result. Although I am here today in my individual capacity, I am taking a risk as a homestead leader and an advocate of the Hawaiian Homes Commission's Act. I will be criticized by homestead leaders and beneficiaries, including those in my homestead who are split in their support of this bill. 
The beneficiary consultation that took place in Kapole on this bill, there are, there are almost a thousand homes in Kapole. And I would venture to say that less than 60 participated in the beneficiary consultation. I am taking a risk and gambling that this bill may just be a long shot. Although I'm sure committees have been instructed to defer this bill or to amend it to do a study as I recently heard. If I have any reservations, it's not whether or not this is a viable, um, this bill is a viable option. Right now, I don't see any options and no one has found a solution of how DHHL is going to get sufficient funding to serve our HHCA beneficiaries. Even when funding was available, DHHL didn't get what they requested as reflected on page one of my testimony. No, my reservations are whether every legislature will acknowledge the failure of your kuleana to our Hawaiian Homes Commissions Act beneficiaries. Will you take the bold step and make a firm commitment that our Hawaiian Homes Commissions Act beneficiaries will be your first priority if this bill passes, will you ensure and protect the terms and conditions of this bill? In my Ohana, we have a saying, show up, stand up, speak up, step up, or shut up, don't grumble. To those who not step up yet will criticize me, I will say, where were you? In all the years, I presented testimony before various committees, by far, this is the most difficult. For reasons stated above, I support SB 1321 with reservations. Mahalo for this opportunity. Have a good day. Thank you so much, Ms. Shadell. Um, next, we have Kapua Maderos in opposition. Hi, Senator, they're not present. Okay. Ray Cho in support. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Chair, Vice Chair, Mahalo for your time. In addition to my written testimony, I speak in support of this bill. I was born in Hawaii. I graduated from Kalani, went to college on the mainland. Then I took a frontline job at a hotel. I moved up fast and got to one of the biggest stages for the hospitality industry, Las Vegas. When I told my mom that I was headed to UNLV, a top hospitality program, she was excited, but like any Christian mother might feel, she had concerns about Sin City. I had my doubts too, but after taking a class called the Sociology of Gambling, I was hooked. 12 years later, PhD in hand, I'm now a researcher in the Center for Gambling Studies at the Rutgers School of Social Work, where I study this issue from different angles. Drive responsibly, drink responsibly, gamble responsibly. Experts agree that prohibiting deviant behavior only makes society harder to manage. My sister said the other day, that casinos are dingy places that attract unsavory characters. I wouldn't want that in my community, she said. Casinos are not for everyone, but if well-regulated and managed, a safe option can exist for that uncle, auntie, or cousin we all know in the family. Studies suggest that casinos can actually be restorative for communities. Imagine going to a resort that is both a global destination and community friendly, a place with restaurants, entertainment, and public spaces that cater to a diverse range of people. Now imagine that a small part of the reason you went to this resort was to help native Hawaiian homelands. I do believe that Hawaii can create something that it can be proud of. Mahalo, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Cho. Um, Kamala, Kamala Werner, MPH, in support. Vilina Maikako, Chair Shimabukuro, Vice Chair Kalole, and members of the Senate Committee on Hawaiian Affairs. My name is Kamala Werner, and I'm a Hawaiian uh, homestead beneficiary. My maternal kupuna are Wamanalo homesteaders, and my paternal uh, kupuna are Lanakuli homesteaders. Today, I speak in support of the intent of Senate Bill 1321 that would help to address a longstanding Native Hawaiian housing crisis, as stated in my written testimony. I am a public health practitioner who has advocated against the siting of another landfill in Nanakuli, proposed to be sandwiched between two homestead communities, and more recently a proposed municipal landfill uh, to potentially be sited next to Wainai Valley Homestead. 
If I'm not challenging environmentally racist city projects, I'm here advocating that our legislators follow the Hawaii State Constitution to sufficiently fund DHHL, and if not, to respectfully not obstruct the department's efforts in trying to do the job that the legislature has failed to do for over 100 years. That legacy amounts to structural racism and has contributed to the communities of Princess Kahanu, Nanakuli, Wainai Valley, and Waimanalo homesteads to have the second, third, fifth, and seventh lowest life expectancies in the state according to US census data. Since houselessness, housing instability, and poor community infrastructure are linked to poor health outcomes and early death as affirmed by numerous public health studies, it is no wonder why Native Hawaiians in their own homeland are suffering. If DHHL does not receive adequate and timely resources to fulfill their mandate, you are actively perpetuating generational violence against us, which would be compounded by the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, economic recession, and climate change. So unless you have a better plan this legislative cycle, or in the very, very near future, I respectfully urge you to pass SB 1321. Mahalo Anui. Mahalo, Mr. Werner. Um, that's all I have listed as in terms of participating um, in this Zoom um, virtually. Of course, there's a lot of written testimony. Did I miss anyone that's here to verbally testify? Okay, okay seeing none, of course, now I have, there's a lot of written testimony. I, I don't, in the interest of time, I probably won't read it all, but like I said earlier, I'll repeat, there's a petition from Senator Favela of 15,600 people against um, SB 1321. We also received um, testimony via the Capitol website of 209 individuals opposed to this bill. Then we got um, testimony from 32 individuals in support of SB 1321. And we got six people with comments on SB 1321. And so all of this testimony is available on the capital.hawaii.gov website. And this is also being shown on YouTube um, live. Um, and so members, um, with that, we've heard from those testifiers. Are there any questions? Yes, Vice Chair Kilokaloli. I have a question for DHHL, please. DHHL is on the line. Go ahead, proceed. Uh, yes, can you address the tax foundation concerns uh, in their testimony regarding the potential exploitation of this bill by federally recognized tribes on the continent to come in and create their own gaming operations? Sure, we received guidance from our attorney general now to add to the wealth of uh, information that lends to the argument that no, this bill does not allow for Indian tribes to freely game in Hawaii. Uh, Indian gaming is regulated by the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. Uh, in order to do so, it does need to be on trust land. Uh, Mr. Yamachika's suggestion that it's as simple as the, uh, the tribe undergoing fee to trust conversion of lands that they would purchase here is not that simple. It requires historical and cultural context tied to their existence as a tribe, which no tribes uh, satisfy here in Hawaii. And then even then, no matter which exception under the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act a tribe attempted to pursue, uh, they would need not only the consent of the governor, but they would need um, consultation with local leaders, which should include yourselves. And so I think the and our attorney general has agreed that while technically it is a remote possibility, the number of hoops that any tribe would have to jump through in order to make that a reality in Hawaii are obstructed purely by political will. If our, our lawmakers did not want to see it happen, the Department of the Interior would not let it happen. And that's evidenced by the fact that in 30 years, the Department of the Interior has only ever used that exception three times. And those three tribes were applying for lands out of their state but tied to their historical reservations. Uh, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, Senator Favela. Okay, we can now uh, stay with the uh, Department of Hawaiian Homeland. Sure. Okay, so in earlier your, your speech of uh, giving independence to our people of Hawaii and going forward on the independence on making the decision but going forward to how this bill was created, again, um, was lack of transparency, uh, was lack of uh, you guys giving the commissioners enough time to dissect. And then the deciding vote was the same uh, person that's helping put this uh, so-called, uh, now was the bill at the time, a casino. So if you guys have so much faith in the beneficiaries and, and the homesteaders, and giving and self-empowering them 
then instead of the governor choosing you guys as directors and deputy directors and commissioners, then we should have the election done by the homesteaders who represent them and truly represent them. Because we get guys on the commission right now that is not beneficiaries. Their best interests, as you say, you guys work hard, and I don't say you guys don't, like I said, but the bottom line is we're going to give you guys who's, who's nominated by the governor, chair and deputy, right, director and deputy, and all the commissioners. So, again, we're not really taking government out of the process. We're taking the people out of the process. So if you guys really, really transparent, right, then you guys put this to a vote to all the beneficiaries on the list, right? Every single homesteader that's living on homestead, put it to a vote to them, to who should be leading and who should be representing them. See, again, we know you guys say you guys know the law, but we're going to set aside uh, a few uh, areas to give you guys well, if you guys are so confident, why don't you guys take out gaming from the bill completely? Because in the back of you guys' head, you guys know going forward, you guys are going to push this and then continue. Now, another thing too, Chair, that I wanted to bring up that I noticed in the bill, why did we take out Koalina? Why was Koalina scratched out? So from Koalina to Maka now, it's open for gaming. When uh, deputy um, said that we would never put anything anywhere in there, so why didn't that stay in the bill? You know, so I'll, I'll give you a chance to answer some of the stuff because I have other questions um, for other uh, testifiers. Well, uh, I would just answer uh, Senator Favela that you have the opportunity to make those suggestions in the form of an amendment to the existing bill and to the proposed amendments that are coming up. The amend the proposed amendments would actually allow for a, a long period of time to have that discussion with the homestead community, the beneficiaries both that have leases already and the ones that are waiting for their leases, which is really where the bill is directed, seeking additional funding to get people off the wait list. So I hope that answers your question. And actually the, the power to get that amendment lies with you in this committee right now. All right, and that's the reason why I continue to stand by my no vote on this whole thing, because if we really were serious about this, um, we would look forward in, in working it another, another way. So I have a, a question for uh, HPD. Okay. They're still on the line. Is HPD still there? Yes, we are. Thank you. So this is this is the thing. So with 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 all of your law oh, you can hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. With all your law enforcement background and your colleagues and other people you work with in the community to keeping our community and our state and city safe. Um did did anyone from the commission or from Hawaiian Homestead ever take into consideration what you guys are trying to express on your guys' expertise in a day-to-day, -day, day to day, every day, on the front lines, protecting us from this kind of stuff. Did they ever come before you guys? No, they did not confer with us. All right, they did. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Other questions, Senator Favela? Or? Yeah, um, back to Hawaiian Homestead. Okay, okay, and then I'll go to come to you, Vice Chair, after. Okay, coming back. So, the due diligence that you do for the people on the wait list and the people on Homestead, where we know we're having a lot of problems in, in all areas. The question for me, you guys went do the research or you guys went go do research outside of uh, the parameters of Hawaii. Um, as we had, um, and, and you guys know I've been on Facebook saying a lot of stuff about um, not speaking to HPD. In, in any of the time, from the time you guys had made this decision, knowing that law enforcement was behind it, 
Did you guys ever think once to talk to the chief, deputy chief, or anybody in the region on how they feel about this bill? Uh, we, we did not, and that is because HPD has been very consistent, uh, as well as the, um, uh, the prosecutor's office in their opposition to um, gaming in Hawaii. So um, we did not because we knew that their, uh, we knew what their thought process was. I mean, I understand you knew that their opposition, but, but because of they're the experts, and then, you know, you guys would come back and say, this is what HPD told us. We took it in consideration and not, not because they, they're, they, they're being consistent in their um, uh, testimony or even before that, because before that, um, when you guys made the decision to take it to the commissioners, even before that, you guys didn't reach out. So you guys didn't even know how they felt to after this was presented to the commissioners and then to, to the community. So that's what I'm asking because um, uh, um, Deputy uh, uh, Guam said that he, uh, you know, talked to uh, some other psychologists mm -hmm. in different areas and, and and Indian reservations and stuff like that, and and the uh, percentage of um, uh, law enforcement or or potential crime and and um, you know um, negative stuff that happens around casinos, and he gave a percent, one percent, maybe maybe two percent would start off. And then back to crime, maybe go down fluctuation. When he was presenting that to the beneficiaries or the commissioners at that time, before that, why was this not not only to the law enforcement and attorney general? Why didn't you guys get some feedback? So when this kind of stuff was answered, then you guys could have just said that HPD was on notice, and we know that they're they're not for it, and at least had their input. This is the reason why I, I saying to have the best interests of Hawaii, yeah, not just the homesteaders, but all of Hawaii, yeah, and we know he's doing this for benefit of the people of, 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 of on the list. But if we really uh, take into consideration of everything, then we should at least because the people that live on homestead and 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 live on homestead, they get their own neighborhood security watch, they get their own law enforcement. Uh, uh, help and they recruit and they work with each other with law enforcement. So knowing that we have the kind of background and working relationship on the homestead with HPD, you know, you guys didn't even think once because you guys say, oh, because they're already consistent in saying no, but still yet, give them the consideration of who they are and the entity that they are and respect the law enforcement background. Um, because, you, you know, you say you didn't talk to the Attorney General and, and HPD because of this, um, um, consistency, but to me, I think that's just an excuse of why you guys didn't go in the beginning because you guys didn't even let the governor know, you know, and he's your boss. So I want to, I want to clarify for the record. I had discussions with the governor, the governor personally opposed it. He told me at the time, but he understood the jurisdiction that the commission has. And that's why we had the discussion with the commission. With regards to HPD, if the question was posed differently, if you were given the resources necessary to help manage the crime that would that may or may not be increased in and around a proposed casino, the answer that this police officer is giving currently would likely be different. This, the other point that I wanna make is we learned last week in the house testimony from HPD that on any given day on Oahu, there's between 70 and 100 illegal game rooms going on. So to act like gambling isn't already occurring, I think does a disservice to the proposal by the department to take some of the revenue from gaming and to apply it to assist both the social services and law enforcement. It depends on the context of the question that you're asking. And I think you're not asking the right question at this point. That's why I answered it the way I did. Okay, thank you. And then, so this is the thing though. So with, with that, knowing that, that we have that much gambling establishments, which we try to work with, with a bill to 
to this to the Senate right now, um, going forward. How is that um, different with what you guys are trying to do? You guys are trying to change the law for uh, uh, benefits for the beneficiaries for now using the Hawaiians, yeah, because they're in the house and using them, a group of people again, yeah, to to try to benefit uh, a, a, a gaming or some kind of gambling. So, like I said, you know, um, this is not going to go anywhere because, um, you know, Mr. Ayla, for whatever reason, um, you know, I just got to just, I'll leave that at that. I'm not going to ask you guys any more questions. I'm going to ask other people. And I just got to, just got to pray for you, my brother. I, I, I just, I just kind of handle when I'm talking to you, you stay looking around and smirking to you guys in the back. And I can see that. And other people can see that. So I just feel that that's disrespectful. So again, I'm not going to ask you any more questions um, because I don't know how to ask the questions. Because okay, you're a professional. I'm not. But I'm going to tell you this. You was hiding this from the beginning. But now the light is shining. And now you guys have changed the apple from red to green. Never happened. Ole. So my next question, if, if you can go vice chair. But the next question I want to ask one of the speakers. Okay. Um, yeah, we'll move to vice chair and then Senator Ihar. So we'll start with Senate, uh, vice chair. Yeah. Kyo Uh, I think, well, okay, I think then uh, if Mr. Cho is on, I'd like to ask him a question. Uh, yes, I'm here. So, you know, in your testimony, you challenge a lot of the assumptions that were made based off of the study cited by the prosecutor's office and even the Commission on the Status of Women. I guess as it relates to the prosecutor's testimony that even one uh, casino uh, would result in, you know, significant increases in the negative social aspects of gaming. Um, I'm wondering if you can comment on those assumptions, Absolutely. And how uh, you challenge them directly in your testimony. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, um, I would say, looking closer at the opposition and, and the, the studies that they cite, uh, you can really go to those same articles um, and see that the conclusions drawn from them are not what the opposition is saying. Uh, for example, um, they cite a study that was done in Macau um, to say, you know, we saw increases in crime and problem gambling. Uh, but in the article itself, it says this is not necessarily a bad sign. Um, and that, um, you know, because that transition was so quick and disruptive to that community, um, those increases uh, really mark... Um, a better way of tracking um, these social ills. So the analogy would be, you know, with coronavirus, you know, we saw spikes early on uh, and, you know, health professionals helped us understand like these spikes are not that more people are getting coronavirus, it's that we're doing a better job testing. Um, so you really don't have to get, go any further than those articles themselves uh, that were cited uh, to see that those conclusions were not necessarily uh, drawn correctly. Um. I, I guess, uh, Chair, if I can ask a follow-up of the sure. prosecutor's office, if they're still on. Sure. I mean, would you like to reply to that? Because you did indicate in your oral testimony that, you know, the citations that you utilize in your testimony led to this conclusion that even just this one uh, establishment would have some sort of significant impact on the community as opposed to the 70 to 100 gaming operations that are operating illegally right now on the island? Well, with regards to the Macau study, I suppose the lesson that Mr. Cho is referring to is that it can be done. This can be that Macau, the things that went wrong there can be seen as a learning opportunity that things could be done better, that things could be done differently elsewhere. Um, and also not to say that there aren't financial, enormous financial benefits um, that resulted from that uh, increase in the number of casinos there. Uh, with regards to the studies indicating the crime increases from just one single casino opening, and those were on Indian reservations, I think nationwide it was a study. And those, um, they did indicate that there was, I believe, there were benefits, of course, the financial gain, um, mortality rates improved by 2%, I believe, the 
there were approximately 5% more jobs or something to that effect. We're not saying that there couldn't be financial benefits, but the negative aspect of it, everything that comes with it, the increases in crime, the increases in um, divorces, bankruptcies, and that's not just in the surrounding community. That's not just in the community where the, the casino is, but it was also observed in the surrounding communities. As we mentioned in our testimony, we simply do not feel that that is the way that the the legislature or the community um, necessarily, well, of course we cannot speak for the legislature. We just don't feel that that is in the best interest of the public safety or welfare. We don't feel that that is what the community truly wants. Um, if there are other alternatives, and of course we are not the experts on economics and development and technology or whatever else might be out there opportunities, but we just feel that there's gonna be less dangerous, less uh, negative ramifications by exploring other industries. Yeah, Thank I, you for that, Trisha. If, if I can ask Chair, uh, Mr. Cho, to follow up on the, the examples in Indian country, and then I'll yield to the, the next question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think uh, in general, um, um, across the studies that I, I evaluated, um, you know, it comes down to how do you measure increases in social ills? Uh, because uh, what, what you'll see scientists sort of debate is, you know, a lot of things correlate with increases in crime. You know, this, you know, seasonality, uh, you know, the development of tourism, urban development. Um, and um, that doesn't, you know, correlation does not necessarily equate to causation. Um, and I would also say, um, the while a bunch of scientists talk about like, well, how do you measure per capita? You know, we got to, you know, if a tourist commits a crime with another tourist, is that an increase in crime in the local community? So while scientists sort of debate this, the public health community is saying, I don't know if we'll ever resolve this. Um, you know, we have people showing up at our doors with problems. Um, and so, so you've really seen in the science that, it, um, that things have kind of taken more of a pragmatic approach, um, you know, sort of fighting this issue of uh, if or if it happens or if, if one causes the other uh, is a separate conversation from it's happening. And it's certainly already here uh, as, as we've discussed in this session. Thank you. Okay, um, Senator Ihara. Uh, Chair, I'd like to ask a question to the uh, Honolulu Police Department. Sure. See, I'm not sure who, who was the person yeah. who tried. Uh, the question is, I wanted to follow up with Mr. Isla's speculation that, and the question is, um, if the police department had adequate resources, um, adequate by the HPD standards, um, would the um, police department change its position and then would it change its position on this bill? I would have to confer with my uh, with my superior on that, but I don't, but I don't, I don't think so. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, um, Senator Favela, you had more questions. Yeah, can I have um, Patty um, Anamuku? Sure. I I get a, I get a couple of questions. Other one was, um, I know you made a statement before about gambling, drugs, distribution, harassment um, in Hawaiian homestead of Nanakuli. Have the beneficiaries reported this to DHHL and the neighborhood board? First of all, I speak on, on behalf of an individual, not as on behalf of a DHHL commissioner or a chair of Nanakuli neighborhood board. But thank you for that question, Senator. Um, should we have seen the increase of crime along our Wainai Moku? And I'm surprised that um, chairman who also resides in Wainai Moku and Senator, that you don't see that. The police department are also limited along the Wainai coast. They cover a large district of our area and they've done a tremendous job in trying to investigate or trying to um, uh, litigate and bring crime down into our area. And the reason I speak on our area, because we have the largest Hawaiian homestead homes there. 
we have seen a numerous gambling establishments that run in Hawaiian homes and the lack of staff from our department and our e-team, it's very difficult to shut them down. And so now that puts the burden on our Hawaii Finest Police Department. And so, you know, there is a concern. There is numerous gaming um, facilities and homes and Hawaiian homes. So um, with, with gaming, illegal gaming homes, we see a lot of meth distribution in our community. We see a lot of drug distribution in our community. We have seen younger women trafficking in the community. So it's such a dangerous um, 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 mechanism for me to understand why we are even talking about gaming when we need to control the crime rate that is happening already in our community. And so, you know, with, with that, um, I hope that answer your question. Mm -hmm. Did you have further questions? Or? Yeah, oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So the question is, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because um, um, they have the participation in the uh, beneficiary consultation on DHHL. I think it was, um, I know it was in January. Um, on, a, on a Monday, I think. I think that's when they had it. Um, I think it was on the eight. was it though? I think it was the 18th. Can, can you explain, um, did you participate in that? Okay, so I also, you know, I also wanted to add as a resident of um, Nanakuli Homestead, I supported and helped work with Honolulu Police Department District 8, which is a great team and we, we've put many with our churches and other uh, neighborhood security watches. And so, you know, we are there to help the department. And so their testimony is really important today, uh, senators, please, and our prosecutor's department, they are telling you about public safety. But let's get back to the beneficiary consultation on that day. Um, the beneficiary consultation, this is my opinion, it is an after the fact beneficiary consultation. What I mean by after the fact is that the commission already voted. And so the beneficiary consultation went after the vote. So that's what you call an after the fact. During that consultation, we had a stormy weather. Nanakuli Ahupu Aha, we didn't have electric. Wainai Moku Homestead, Miley, up there, they even text me. The electric was flickering, we were going off. I couldn't participate because I lost my electricity during the storm and the rain during the time of the beneficiary consultation during that six o'clock PM. Yes, they did offer another consultation, but it was during my time of sitting and serving as a commissioner. So I didn't have the opportunity to serve again. And so, you know, um, it's very difficult to have these Zoom meetings. Kupunas don't have computers, virtual. We're, we're in a COVID. Everybody's afraid they need to be safe. Um, beneficiary consultations in the past were open meetings. We would, we would see each other. So, you know, it, it, it's um, very difficult and we can't meet. And, and, and a lot of us are not computer erratic. So it's very hard. And, you know, so that's what happened. Okay, so just, I just have two, two more, uh, Chair. Um, this one is, 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 is according to um, this bill. Um, by, by being a beneficiary and, and living on homestead, um, you think, now not as a commissioner, not as a, as a chair, but just as, as, as a person that lives on homestead in the previous past and even now, would have the fate of letting, empowering, the word they're using, empowering the Hawaiians who's being cho chosen by non-Hawaiians to make the decision on what kind of gaming they're going to have. Do you have do you have feet in that process as a homesteader? I think what is important as a beneficiary, and I speak on this as a beneficiary, is that we have to have confidence in our department on commissioners, and also we have to have faith that um, uh, they are beneficiaries. They understand the struggle. They understand the need. They understand the right decision for Native Hawaiians. That's truly important. I mean, I'd like to ask this board who's beneficiaries on the Senate Hawaiian Affairs Committee. That's an important question. 
um, you know, you're making a very big decision. You're not just bringing gambling on Department of Hawaiian Homelands. You change the entire law of the state of Hawaii. And so this should be nursed a little longer. It, it, and, and, and it should be um, dissected. It should be where we should have more talk. Um, I am concerned about the amendments that you folks, uh, the three senators voted. Um, these amendments just give us a few days over the weekend on President's Day weekend, um, the ability to, to input. Um, I'm hoping that public hearings go through, but it also has to go through the commission again. And so the commission meet next week, Tuesday and Wednesday. Do, will they have time to see these amendments? Okay, well, the last one, Chair, thank you. Thank you for um, indulging with my questions. Sure. Um, 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 okay, so now the governor um, appoints commissioners to, to the HHL. Do you feel your services on the DHHL commission board has been um, affected, effective, the word effective, by um, Prince Kuhio's mission? You know, I'm gonna speak as a uh, native Hawaiian vahine and um, part being Tahitian and Hawaiian um, for ancestry, but I'm also a beneficiary, very fortunate to have Hawaiian homelands in Nanakuli. Um, being appointed to this department um, in 2019 by Governor Ige um, gave me the opportunity. And I remember when he appointed me, he was you know, very embraceful and said to serve the people. And with that appointment, I really took that underlying, serve the people. Thank you, Governor Ige, for that. And so this is my judiciary duty um, is to serve the people. Um, and the people is our beneficiaries. And so it is truly important that, and, and I think that being on the commission, I also voted no on different oppositions. Um, I vote from my na'au. If I don't feel like it's a right um, vote, I, I don't. Um, you know, but we also have other great commissioners that serve too, and um, that are way smarter than I am. Trust me, they are. Um, but um, you know, I'm gonna continue to serve and take this appointment very uh, seriously. Uh, thanking the governor and um, having to see him on the news the next day and said that he opposed it really caught my heart. I thought I was going to get one COVID attack by listening to that. So I'm surprised that the governor doesn't support it. And I, I couldn't help but you know think that, whoa, how am I, I might have had a COVID attack because the day before the commissioner, the four commissioners, the five commissioners voted for it. So it's really puzzling. You know, it's very puzzling and I understand or even the Senate president in Kauai has an article that he didn't support it. So I, I'm just kind of confused and trying to make things match up. And so thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I'll you for now. Thank you. Um, Senator Ocasio, a question? Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you everyone for your comments on, on all sides. It's really important to hear everybody's perspective um, and I take it all into consideration. Uh, my question is for um, Chair Isla and um, DHHL, if they're still here. Aloha. Aloha. So um, my question for you folks is, does the legislation, let the legislature have an obligation to raise the revenue for DHHL to fulfill your mission? Yes, it has a constitutional um, responsibility. And so with that being said, if you folks were adequately funded, would you be seeking out alternative um, projects that divert from the mission itself to, um, to get funding? For example, gaming, cannabis sales, or, any lem or a lemonade stand? Uh, the answer would be no, but historically for the last 100 years, we have not been able to count on it. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, Vice Chair Kilo Kaloli. And by the way, I just, we, we got, um, we're gonna have an extra 15 minutes on this. I just got a note from IT, so we can go to 245. Vice Chair. Uh, thank you, yeah, for, for DHHL. Oh, um, you gotta unmute yourself, Vice Chair. <laughs> All right, thank you. Okay, for DHHL, so, um, is it accurate that three out of four DHHL beneficiaries are on the wait list? Yes. Ish, so only yeah. one out of four actually have a homestead lease. That's right. It's about 10,000 to 28,000. So closer to maybe one in 
Oh yeah, yeah, three to four. There you go. Okay, so uh, from a fiduciary standpoint, is it fair to say that there are two different classes of beneficiaries that exist? There's there's three classes of beneficiaries that exist. There are those that have and are on homesteads already. There are those who are waiting, and there are those who have chosen not to put their names to the wait list. Um, that last class is almost uncountable, but you also have to consider the families of this impact because there are children and siblings and husbands and wives that can inherit. So it's so much bigger than 28,000 names and all of those people waiting and who are impacted by their qualifying beneficiary waiting, that number is even larger than three out of four, right? It, the fraction gets much larger when you consider all of the people who could potentially inherit and are also sort of shorted. Um, and so from a, and so from a trust law standpoint, it, it is a violation of fiduciary responsibility to discriminate between beneficiaries by having different beneficiary classes. Isn't that fair to say? A, a trustee could potentially be jeopardizing their fiduciary responsibility by prioritizing, by not treating all beneficiaries equal and prioritizing the, the, the needs of one beneficiary class over the other. And so when you do beneficiary consultation, uh, what per how often do you get participation from the beneficiaries that are on the wait list? That's 75%. I think the best that we've done is about 7% who are contacted show up for beneficiary consultation. What, so um, as a function of, of, of an individual beneficiary consultation, uh, how much of the beneficiary response normally do you get from individuals who are on the wait list versus individuals who are homesteaders? I have to, I don't, but I would, I would guess that it's probably lower for wait listers than it is for um, actual beneficiaries. Yeah. And so what is the, um, you know, in the testimony, one of the homestead associations referred to the use of commercial, uh, uh, commercial designated uh, DHHL lands for revenue generating purposes, the lingual doctrine. Have you polled the beneficiaries on utilization of the lingual doctrine for the department to take, you know, use on its own volition, trust resources to generate revenue for development of homestead lots? Not in that framework, but in order for land to be designated for commercial use, it needs to go through beneficiary consultation. So the fact that the land is even designated commercial indicates that beneficiary, consul beneficiary consultation was done. Beneficiaries were aware that that land uh, was intended for use for revenue generation. 7% of, of the 75% of homestead beneficiaries. Who respond? Right. The vice chair, if I could just add, sorry, if I could just add, you know, this lingual doctrine, I'm not sure where that comes from. Um, in 1921, when the Homestead Act was being implemented, uh, the revenue that was used to run the Hawaiian Homes Commission and the Act was based upon revenue off of available lands. So it was the lands that were leased to the sugar companies and the uh, ranches at the time. So from the very inception of this program, the department has had to um, generate revenue to help cover its costs. So I, I can appreciate that, Chair, but I think what I'm trying to get at is that when 75% of your beneficiary community is on the wait list and only 7% of that class of beneficiaries even respond to beneficiary consultation, then is it even possible at all for a beneficiary consultation on any issue, let alone gaming, to reflect the sentiment of your beneficiary community? That, that's a good question. I can tell you that the, uh, the number of respondents increase when the letter that goes up is making an offering to either a house or a vacant lot. So the only thing that we can surmise is the, the folks that are on the wait list, um, consider what the department is asking them to participate in, but they're really just waiting for um, their house or their lot. So, 
Chair, with your indulgence, I, I want to ask on one, one other point of the department. Sure. You know, the Commission on the Status of Women said that the, in their gender, in their uh, report related to the, the casino proposal, they said that the suggestion that DHHL's inadequate funding is the result of poor management is rooted in racist stereotyping that ignores the state's historical responsibility to fund the department. And your deputy in the House hearing uh, mentioned institutional racism. So, you know, as it relates to that, are the federal funding, the federal financing programs for homestead mortgages more restrictive than the federal financing programs for the general public? They're only more restrictive in terms of um, not being able to uh, get lending on the fee simple versus leasehold. Um, and I think it's like 5% less in terms of uh, certain FHA loans where uh, refinancing the amount that you're eligible for. Other than that, it's the same. Well, but as a result, you have less than five lenders on in the state of Hawaii that finance homestead properties, right? That is correct. And the, the state funding for DHHL really only started in earnest in the 90s under the Waihei administration. Isn't that correct? As part of the settlement, we got significant amounts. But in terms of general funds, um, actually, really within the last eight years. It's actually six years. But uh, I'll move on. And the department is responsible for millions of dollars of municipal infrastructure in homestead communities because you've had trouble getting the counties to accept responsibility for the homestead roads, sidewalks, street lights. Is that is that not accurate? That's I'm sorry, go, go. that's that's true. But we're also responsible for infrastructure that the, the municipalities are not responsible for taking over. We have water systems that we're responsible for. We are responsible for enforcement on Hawaiian homelands. Meaning, short of having actual police officers, we have non-deputized individuals going out and policing a state a statewide system and there are just two of them we i mean our costs are spread across so many different responsibilities that arguably but are in they, particular in particular isn't it true that on oahu over a million dollars a year is spent on infrastructure repair and maintenance costs that are normally borne by the counties in regular development outside of hawaiian homeland the answer is yes, and if you factor in the um, sewer systems from Papakolea, that number goes up to um, somewhere around 60 or $70 million. And so on top of that, uh, a legislator who represents a community with homesteads in it, uh, they're already responsible for the general infrastructure, education, healthcare, all the other state responsibilities. But on top of that, legislators who represent homestead communities are expected to go and advocate for infrastructure funding on top of those responsibilities to develop these homesteads, which are requests that legislators who don't represent homesteads don't have to make, right? Right, and, and I would add that that is exactly why our sufficient sums budget ask is as high as it is. And so in your testimony, how much of the $64 million in shovel-ready home development projects including the 253 home project in Nanakuli, uh, are included in the administration's proposed budget this year. Can you repeat the question? So in your testimony, you, you list $64 million worth of shovel-ready homestead home construction projects. But for funding from the government, the state, in the form of, in the form of capital improvement project funds, those, those projects are ready to be built. They're shovel ready, right? One of which in your testimony is a $10 million project for 253 homes in Nanakuli. How yes. many of those developments are, how many of those developments did the governor approve in his budget that he submitted in January? Uh, the governor, uh, well, the governor put in his budget that was submitted to the legislature, $20 million um, for all, $20 million to which we can apply to uh, any one of these projects that are listed. So there's no specific amount for an individual project. Um, we have $20 million in CIP and $5 million in uh, what is called CIP maintenance. So 
the maintenance has been put off so long that we have to use CIP to replace those structures or replace the, um, the infrastructure. Um, maintenance that might traditionally be borne by the counties. That is, that is correct. So it does seem like there's a system that's been set up in place here that, prov that requires the Department of Hawaiian Homelands to do more than just one thing, which is build housing. Seems like the department is required to do many different things and hence the problem. Senator, I think I see where you're going with this. And I mean, if you want a, an example of how this is institutional racism, what you need to consider is when we talk about the affordable housing crisis across the state, that discussion begin, begins in the hundreds of millions of dollars across every single department, across all the counties, and everyone is expected to pitch in. When we talk about the affordable housing crisis on Hawaiian homelands, we're capped at $20 million and expected to carry the majority of the list, the lift, ourselves. I mean, that is a glaring error. If you want to know what institutional racism look like, looks like, it's the fact that a lottery bill made it out of a committee yesterday in the House with an allocation of zero dollars to Native Hawaiians, and we couldn't even get a decision. Well, we'll see how that vote turns out on Tuesday. Sure, sure. Thank you. I, I, yeah. Thank you. Okay, Senator Ocasio. I do appreciate the conversation about institutional racism, um, but going back um, to the comment, uh, the uh, beneficiary consultation process, um, I guess my question, so as a teacher, if I teach a lesson and then I give my students a test and they fail the test, is that a reflection of my students or is it a reflection of my teaching? And so as I, as I become better at teaching, I recognize actually it's, it's my teaching and so with that analogy um, and, and learning that 7% maybe of waitlisters wait respond, or I'm not sure if it was waitlisters or beneficiaries, sorry about that detail, but, but the idea being um, is the flaw with the process of consultation being that maybe, for example, if it's, if it's advertised on computer or TV, what about those folks that spend most of their time outside in the mala and they don't they don't focus on TV, but they have a very important contribution to the conversation, but they're not wrapped into the conversation. And so I guess in terms of the consultation process, um, what what could change to really gain trust in that the consultation process is really consulting um, those individuals that are on the list? Okay. Well, we constantly seek ways to improve beneficiary consultation. The amendments to this bill would allow for additional time to go and do additional beneficiary consultation. You know that? And with, I mean, with the five-year timeline to do that, um, I mean, we're hopefully looking at a more unrestricted travel. Typically, beneficiary consultation allows us to go into the communities, especially for those types of um, beneficiaries who maybe aren't as connected or willing to use Zoom and Microsoft Teams. So there is a significant amount of time and there's still under these amendments, the opportunity for the commission to say no, right? The, the ultimate objective of whatever gets constructed is not a foregone conclusion, but it does give us the time and the authority for the commission as Commissioner Turia would like to see, it gives them five years to make a decision. Thank you. Um, I actually have some questions. I don't know if, if, if Homilani Shadel, if, are you still here? If so, you know, there are issues brought up about the consultation that took place, um, you know, on this current bill. And, you know, there was conditions about the concerns about the weather and people not being able to do it. So I, I understand, do you, I think you participated in the consultation. Um, do you have any comments to make on that? Um, yes, I do. I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Um, yes, I did participate in the Kapolei, which included Ka'ulo Kaha'i. Um, their zip code is Forever Beach, but they were also included in the um, Kapolei region beneficiary consultation, which was on January 13th. And like I stated before, I would say that um, less than 60 of 900 homes plus participated. Um, in terms of the statewide beneficiary consultation, I'm sorry to hear that the um, Waianae area was not able to participate or Nanakuli because of 
the, the weather at that time. Um, having said that, though, I, I'm aware that the um, consultation notice was sent out to all other applicants and um, other ben and homestead beneficiaries across the state. So that would, in my approximation, be over 20,000 notices went out. I participated in the um, January 18th one, which uh, was at 6 p.m. And I'm not sure what the count is. I think it's less than 200. And then for the January 19th, I couldn't you know, participate in that one. I had something else to do, but that was, I believe at 1 p.m. It was lunchtime. And I understand because when I first heard about this thing, the first thing I thought of was BC, beneficiary consultations. Like why has, this needs to go out to the community. But then I was, um, then I remembered that Title 10 admin rules require the staff before going to do beneficiary consultation, that whatever they're doing, they have to present it to the commission and um, get the commission's approval before they can conduct beneficiary consultation. And basically that does make sense because if the commission is not gonna approve it, it's not gonna go any further. It ends with the commission. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the timing, I guess, was critical, but that's, you know, that's the way beneficiary consultation with the department works. Thank you so much. And I wanted to ask um, Mr. Cho, you're still there too. You know, I, I am. I am also concerned about the testimony from the Commission on Status of Women and an HPD and Prosecutor's Office. Um, do you have any examples of where a casino or a, you know gaming may have actually lowered crime rates in a, in a community or made other you know improvements to the community? If Mr. Oh, yes. Can, can Can you hear me? And or. Um, yeah, we can hear. You can't uh, see it. We can. Uh, okay, that's all right. Yeah. Um, let me see. Um, I know there are a few specific studies, but it, it really does come down to how you, you measure um, improvements. Uh, but there are definitely um, uh, cases uh, that I can do. One, one that comes off the top of my mind is uh, uh, Norway, a very productive, uh, progressive society, so, sort of uh, took a more uh, interesting and, and kind of progressive approach to say, like, you know, I'm not sure if we're, we're going to be able to get rid of this social ill. Uh, so let's just uh, take, take a really good look at it. Um, and uh, they were—they actually saw um, lower instances of problem gambling uh, as well. Uh, Singapore is also uh, an important example. Um, I think their integrated resort um, uh, development, uh, they issued two licenses um, and that really um, uh, helped uh, to drive revenue, but also, you know, um, uh, I'm not, uh, there are other instances where, you know, you, you talk to community leaders and they do surveys uh, and residents and community leaders um, will st start to say that uh, you've seen um, improvements in the quality of life. Um, so again, the measurement is the hard part. You know, uh, each side will have their statistics to point to, uh, but really, uh, our job as scientists is to work with whatever data we have, uh, and that's not always collected uh, in the right way. I think um, across the gambling sciences community. Uh, it, it really, I think the, the modern day science really says is, can we do a good job tracking? Can we do a good job screening uh, and, and finding better ways to take temperatures of the community? Otherwise, we're just working here with anecdotes and cherry pick statistics here and there. Um, but I think uh, there are definitely uh, cases um, such as Singapore, I, I would uh, definitely note as um, sort of having a positive uh, effect toward having a restorative effect. Um, you know, and these are all, this is a very young science. So I, I'd also point to communities like Vancouver. Um, uh, their government set up a little bit different where the state, um, uh, the country takes a little bit more of a leadership role um, in, in running these things. Um, uh, but um, certainly there are models out there uh, that exist uh, to say if, if done in a multifaceted and multidisciplinary way, um, we can at least track what's going on in our communities uh, and, and make sure that uh, resources get deployed uh, in a way um, that works for the community. Um, uh, but yeah, just, just to take a blanket statement and say, you know, the gambling itself uh, uh, allows for these social ills to rise. It, it's kind of the same thing as saying, you know, if you put more cars on the road, uh, that's going to increase uh, car accidents. Um, but really what it comes down to is how responsible are the drivers in those cars? 
Um, and then that, that is something that we, we also want to measure as scientists, uh, not just looking at, at sort of these surface macro level statistics. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, and then there's one more question for DHHL and then I'll go to Senator Ocasio. Um, so DHHL, um, you know, as I, as I noted earlier, you know, the testimony of this hearing is overwhelmingly against um, this bill. But my understanding is from when you folks surveyed uh, beneficiaries, it was about 50-50 split for and against the casino. Is, is, is that correct? And if so, can you kind of go into more detail about that? Sure, we did an informal survey of those who participated in the Kapolei specific region when, we, when the bill was thinking of Kapolei. Um, it skewed slightly positive of 50-50. And then the inform same informal survey that was put out in the statewide beneficiary consultations the first night skewed 50-50, the second night skewed a little negative of 50-50. And then in the comment period that has followed, uh, the testimony has been maybe also skewed just a little negative of 50-50, not quite 60% negative, but in that range. So every opportunity we've given for input, and I would add that the statewide, I mean, excuse me, the comment period, we cannot limit to beneficiaries. So we are sort of tracking where the beneficiaries fall. It's still sort of a middle of the ground, not an overwhelming majority on either side issue. Wow, interesting, interesting. Okay, Senator Ocasio. I, I yield, Chair. Oh, okay, uh, Senator Favela. Okay, uh, unmute please, Kurt. I got a question um, for DHHL. So, um, for, for DHHI, I know you answered this in, in so, so many words before, but I just want to be clear. Um, um, why does DHHL have um, you listed as director and chairman and a commissioner? Um, I, know, I know you answered this, but can you just uh, indulge me for a while? Because I have a list of questions that I have. What was the question is, what is my title? No, no, I said you are, you are listed as the director and chairman of the commissioners. Yeah, I serve two roles, yes. Okay. So the question is, the second one is, I think that this is the only the department, if you can clarify, is this the only department where the commissioner um, does not vote, or the commissioners don't vote for their own chair? Uh, no. No. Um... When I served as the chair of the Board of Land and Natural Resources, I also served as the director of the department. Um, the chair of the Department of Agriculture also serves as the uh, director of the Department of Agriculture. So the, the next one is, um, I've only been here a short while, you know, I'm not here, I've been around here as long as you have, and the rest of the senators. But when you lobby for a bill, um, or you're going to be lobbying for a future bill, and then um, as a commissioner, um, you have a vote and a say. Um, you think you shouldn't have had excuse yourself from that vote, knowing that this is going to go forward um, like where it is now? I mean, you you um, you wanted the per pe uh, forefronts of this bill besides the other other people in the room. But you think it's, I mean, it's like, I, I don't know, I don't know how else to say it, but I mean, you think it's, it's um, okay for, for um, doing, doing, having that two roles and, and be able to do that? Yes, because the commission is the policy making body, but any policy that the commission makes, the department has to implement. So I'm able to implement uh, at the department level, the policies that the commission does. So my role as a commissioner is to uh, take a look at whatever um, things that policies need to be made upon and put on the fiduciary hat, which is different from the, slightly different from the implementing of the, depart of the department's um, role in that policy. So uh, I don't see a conflict. Of course, of course. Yeah, thank you. Um, can I have uh, Robin, um, Robin Danner? Thank you. Thank you, um, Chair Love. Robin Danner, are you still there?
Robin Downer still here? I think she might. She might have left. Uh, they're not present. Okay. They're not present. Okay. Then I then I you for now. Thank you. Okay, okay members. Um, and we do need to wrap this up. Listen, anybody has some, some final any final questions? Okay. Okay, so seeing none, so as I announced- AG, Sorry, Chair, oh, is that, is the, the, the AG not on, right? The AG is not on this neither, right? Is the uh, AG- is that, is Attorney General, anyone? Attorney General's here? Matt? I don't, I, don't, I don't think we had the AG, unfortunately, no. Well, the only reason why it would be good to have the AG kind of weigh on this because, I mean, that's another person that didn't participate, but thank you, Chair. Thank you for your- Thank you. Thank you for your questions. Um, okay, so as I announced at the beginning of this hearing, we're going to defer decision making uh, on this measure SB 1321 the next week, Tuesday, that's February 16th at 1.01 p.m. Um, virtually. And um, as I summarized, there's a proposed SD1 that um, basically, you know, gives the, makes the decision making power to the Hawaiian Homes Commission to decide whether or not they want to pursue gaming. They'll have a five year window to do that. Um, and so we're going to, um, the intent is to um, post the proposed SD1 along with the DM decision uh, hearing notice so that the public can see this proposed SD1 and as well as all of you, of course. Um, and so anyway, that is the plan. So we're going to defer till February 16, 101 p.m. virtually with the proposed SD1 for SB 1321, the casino bill. And with sure. that, um, yeah, yeah, yes, sure. um, before we um, adjourn. Um, yes. I just, you know, I mean, I know this is going to go to the floor and we got to um, hash this thing all out and we're deferring the decision making, but I just didn't see the reason for deleting the whole Kualina aspect, um, you know, and then again, maybe later on you can discuss that with me, but I just don't understand why Kualina, from Kualina to Macau um, now is open game. So um, maybe you can explain that to me. Um, we have a few minutes. DHHL, did you want to address that about in the SD1 with the Kotlina lands west of Kotlina were removed? I think uh, I can't speak to why uh, Senator De La Cruz didn't specifically include them, but we wouldn't be opposed to that language being put back in. That's no problem to the department. Okay, but but my guess is possibly that because we're not now we're no longer limiting the bills to a casino. Maybe that was the part of the reason if we're going to open up to maybe bingo or, you know, um, lottery, or, you know, maybe that was part of the reasoning. That yeah, not but no, yeah, so no, just a quick one. So, hey, bingo is all G, whatever, okay, you guys want to do bingo, but you don't need Kualina and you don't need uh, the West Side to do bingo because nowadays this technology, you can do computer bingo. These guys um, right now, Isla and all these guys in their homestead where they're at now, they can conduct on, on bingo right from the office. Yeah. It's, it's virtual. It's like how we do it now. We don't need Kulina okay. and the West Side. So we need to protect the West Side. That's all I'm saying. Thank okay. you. Okay, thanks. But yeah, I can. I support. I mean, okay. with comments. Okay. DHHL, did you want to say anything to that or, or no? Um, I, would, I would just add that if um, Senator Favela would like to see Bingo be a result of this bill, the bill allows for that. It gives the Hawaiian Homes Commission the discretion to consider it for the next five years. And if the Hawaiian Homes Commission by a super majority, not just by uh, a majority, but by a super majority, if they think that bingo is the way to go with this, my job is just to implement that. But I think this bill does more to give them the power to make that decision, Senator, than it does uh, make the decision for them. No, no, I wasn't worried about what you guys decide you guys are gonna make. I was just, I just wanted to put Kulina to the to Macau on the no touch zone. That's, that's I just want to protect that area. That, that's no objection. I decide yeah. later on what you guys could decide, but I just wanted to put that in the back in the bill. Thank okay. you. Thank you so much. Okay, so with that we are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>